Hi everybody. Hi, 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 hi. Welcome to our touching base class this evening. <laughs> I'm just shaking my head a little bit because I was on Instagram and just uh, was <laughs> listening to young men relate uh, some latest uh I don't want to say gossip, <laughs> but it is gossip about DeVito. And I'm a DeVito fan, okay? For those of you who may not know, DeVito is an R&B, uh, not R&B, is an Afro beats, young man, Afro beats musician. And <laughs> I was trying to start up Instagram and there's another young man that I follow uh, who's a funny guy. He's, he's a comedian, but he was a hard, he's a hardworking comedian. And he was commenting on, on, on David o, um, when his delivery is funny. And uh, <sighs> it's all the stories about pregnancies and stuff, things of that nature. <clears throat> But, but what's funny is the way he delivered, the way he delivered the story. You know, I think that for me was the funny part. Here, the Instagram folks, let me just move these cameras over here so I have everything aligned. <laughs> You know, folks are doing all these things when they're young, and when they get uh, when when they get older, they 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 usually regret. They usually regret. But it is what it is. Hello, everybody. Again, this is Dr. Tochi, aka Dr. Dr. Tochi. Uh, welcome to today's uh, class. And uh, I welcome those of you who are watching from different time zones. I am aware that um, you know, for some people it's in the middle of the night, and some for some people it's in the evening, and for some folks it's in the morning. So wherever you are around the world, welcome. Um, please take a moment to like video if you're on facebook youtube instagram take a moment to like the video that lets um folks know that we have started class okay i know some of you like to hide <laughs> okay let's see digibel says uh in london is 3 a.m oh okay in london is 3 a.m um Hello, unholy bishop. Okay. So, I think in South Africa it should be four or five a.m. Okay. So please take a moment to like the video or give it a thumbs up. It lets other people know that we are in class. Okay, unholy bishop says in Nigeria is 3 a.m. Oh, okay. Um, okay. 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 3 a.m. You're up in the middle of the night. But it's all good. We're here to learn. Okay. Sabelo Chonko is saying good morning. <laughs> so um, I don't even know where to ask where Sabelo Chonko is at saying good morning. I know um, here in the United States, for a lot of people, it's evening, okay, or late evening, okay. So take a moment to like and share the video because that lets people know that class has started. And today, and, and in today's class, we are going to, uh, thank you, Unholy Bishop. <laughs> thank you for the hearts. Um, we're going to talk about something interesting that, um, also pulls up in our spiritual walks and spiritual paths 
It is a topic that I have already treated as a free YouTube video, but um, this story was quite interesting to me and I was like, well, let's treat it um, in a touching base live class because again, we look at what happens in life um, and then we start saying, okay, is there some kind of spiritual significance to the thing that we're looking at or the thing that we are seeing, right? If you need me, you need to reach me for divinations, consultations, for your dream interpretation, spiritual practice coaching. If you need courses and lectures and products, please go to my website at tochi.us. T-O-C-H-I dot U-S. I don't do transactions outside of my website, okay? I will never be in in your um, DMs or in the comment section asking you to call me on WhatsApp. I'm not going to be in your comment section asking you to call some long-distance number, all right? All my transactions go through my website, okay? Even if you go to my Facebook, my Instagram, okay, my YouTube, and you want to get a hold of me, it, you will see the instructions for going to my website. And my website is very simple, T-O-C-H-I dot U-S. It's a very secure website, okay? So don't allow yourself to be scammed by people who, who pretend to be me or claim to be me. If a person is reaching out to you claiming to be me, tell the person to speak, <laughs> okay? Tell the person you want to see them live on video and you want to hear them speak. And you will very easily know whether they're me or not. I am aware that people are using AI, artificial intelligence, to clone other people. Um, I actually did a little AI experiment on my YouTube, on my, um, on my Instagram, where I used a picture of myself and submitted it to AI to see how I would look speaking with AI. So if you want to see that, please go to my Instagram. Uh, I've, I have two Instagram accounts, so you can go there. You will see, you'll see me there with a. It has a black background, and you'll see me saying something. But that's an AI of myself, and I put it there so that. Uh, people can start getting to understand how AI works, okay? Today on the news, um, I was listening to a lady, she fights, uh, she is into fighting for the environment or fighting against trafficking of people or something. And there are people who have now taken her image and her voice and they put it through AI to, to create porn okay and she was on the radio on NPR talking about that and the purpose of taking her and putting running her through AI is to make her shut up they want to embarrass her so they they took so what they do is they take the face of the person and they and they uh, and these are called deep fake videos and some of the deep fake videos, you can tell that they're not well done, but some of them are very well done. They will take a person's face and transpose that on the video of someone else and make it look like it's that person. So she was talking about how this morning, how they've taken her, they've taken Hillary Clinton, they've taken Greta... Uh, Greta, you know, the young girl who is the environmental activist. And the woman was saying that over 90% of the people who are being uh, attacked or, or humiliated or things like that with deep fake videos are women, are women, especially if they want to embarrass the woman, they would now take use this AI and create a deep fake video. The reason why they're called deep fake videos is because the videos look real. So they will take like a, a porn video. You, you folks will know what a porn video is. And then they will take the face of this person and put it on 
the female image. And the AI for these kind of deep fake videos has been trained with female faces and female voices. So when they start putting women's faces on these videos, the AI does the job very well because it's been trained. Remember, AI is trained. AI is trained. Artificial uh, intelligence is trained. So the more it's like the more you give it of something, the more it learns about what you're giving it. <coughs> Excuse me. Okay. And then the woman was saying the man um, who has the highest number of, <coughs> excuse me, the man who has the highest number of deep fakes about him, according to her research, is Donald Trump. Okay. So, but that the Donald Trump ones don't look too good because those videos, uh, because the AI is the, Excuse me, because the AI the AI does a better job of creating deep fake videos with women than with men. So I say this to let folks know to start getting ready. Don't don't put your head under a rock and say, well, it doesn't affect me, it doesn't concern me. It concerns you because First of all, somebody, if they, now that AI is proliferating, now that AI is being made easily available to anyone, you need to be aware that someone could take your picture. They could even just take a recording of your voice and use AI to start creating content, fake content that looks like you. In fact, they have scammers here in the US um what they're doing is they call you on the phone and when you go hello hello they're actually recording your voice and they won't say anything they'll go help and you'll be saying hello hello they won't say anything then they'll hang up they get a recording of your voice then they take it to the to ai and with the they will now write out what they want you to say and then with that snippet of your voice, the AI will now, they, they feed the snippet of your voice to the AI. And all this is done on, on a browser window. It's done on a computer. Okay, you can even do this on your phone. When you submit that sound bite of the person's voice to the AI, the AI will take it, learn it, and then use it to say anything you want it to say. And so what the scammers are doing is that they're taking snippets of people's voices and they will create um, 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 they will create messages and or they'll create voices and then they will call like say your relatives okay and the ai remember they now type out they write a script what they want that ai to say and so and then so then they'll call for instance your children or your spouse or somebody and then that ai will use your voice and start saying help me help me uh send me money i'm stranded send me money this is where i am or the police have me or somebody has me or something is going on and then you hearing this on the phone because you know the voice of your loved one or your friend you'll be thinking that it's real and then you'll start responding to it like it's real, but you won't know that it's AI. AI that has just learned your the person's voice. So it is important that we know that these things are happening, okay? I know uh, we're here to learn about the uh, why a deadly co cobra will be flying with a South African pilot. I know that's what we're supposed to be talking about in today's class, but you know, so you know, as we say, sometimes one topic leads to another topic. Folks, I need you to start protecting yourselves, and that is the reason why, if you're not sure, do a video call. Thus, just like DJ Bell was said, do a video call. If you are not sure, if the person is saying things that sound strange. If the person is saying things that sound unusual, just imagine, let me pick somebody, okay? 
So DeMarcus, imagine, okay, DeMarcus is here and somebody calls you and says, oh, I'm Dr. Tochi, please help me. I'm stranded out here in the deserts of Arizona. Can you send me money? Now, DeMarcus would be like, oh, Mama Tochi. Okay, let me do whatever it is that I can help. No. The smart thing for DeMarcus to do is to say, I want to see you on the video call. Are you available on Zoom or Google Meet or, uh, you know, Android video or, you know? And that's when the scammer will say, no, I'm not available and hang up. Oh, no. Or they might say, no, I don't have enough signal. I don't have enough uh, whatever. When you get these kinds of calls, they will always be asking for money. And this is now replacing kidnapping. Because, you know, especially in developing nations, um, in some parts of the world where people still kidnap for ransom, okay? This is going to replace kidnapping. This is going to replace kidnapping because they're just going to call and you're gonna, they're going to say, oh yeah, here's the voice of your loved one. And the person is like, help, help, help me, help me, help me. And if you don't call that person back on their number or find a way to reach them with another number or call them on video, you're going to be deceived thinking that you're speaking with a person you know and you won't know that it's all artificial intelligence. So mark my words, you're going to see a lot of that replacing kidnapping. People are no longer going to be kidnapping for money or for ransom. They're going to be like, okay, we got a clone of this person's voice. We're going to be playing this thing and <clears throat> you know, um, get their loved ones to, to, to pony up some money. So people, we need to be aware of what's going on. I know we talk about practical spirituality, but we also have to be practical about our lives and be aware of what is going on. We need to be aware. We need to be aware of going, what's going on. We cannot pretend, oh, it happens to other people. It's not going to happen to me. The internet has made the world flat. The internet has made the world flat. Okay. It has made the world flat. And that is a figurative, I don't mean that literally, but I mean that figuratively. The internet has made the world flat. It takes almost no time for something that's happening in, in, in uh, Czechos, well, Czechoslovakia. I can no, no longer exist. But um, it takes no time for something that's happening in Egypt to become the norm in Peru. And it takes no time for something that's the norm in Mexico to become the norm in Australia. Because on the internet, somebody starts doing it, they post on the internet how they're doing it, somebody else copies. Before you know it, everybody's copying it, everybody's doing it. And they do these things as quickly as possible to start reaping the benefit before you even know what is going on, okay? So we're at the point where if somebody is calling you and asking you to pay for something or calling you and asking you to send money, do a video call. And if you don't have a phone that can do a video call, tell the person, I will call you on your regular phone. And if the person starts saying, my battery died, you can't call me on my regular phone. I, I know I'm calling you from this other phone, but this you, you have to have a way of verifying, even if it's a code word. Sometimes I will test people with a code word. Okay. I will test people with a code word. And usually that's where all of that will just fall apart. I can say, hey, DeMarcus, uh, you know, DeMarcus, where were you last year? Where were you in June of last year? And if the person responds, I will know whether they're telling the truth or not. I will ask something very specific. I can say, okay, DeMarcus, where were you June of last year? In what state were you June of last year? 
And if the person gives me the wrong answer, I just hang up. You should be able to ask a question to verify a question that that no one else can know. That person should be able to answer. This is now if you don't have video or for whatever reason, you know, the, the video. So we have to be smart. We have to be smart, okay? All right, so if anybody, again, is coming to you saying that they're me and they're sounding like me, but they don't, they don't want to do video, they, you know, and they don't want you to see their face, just understand it's a fake, it's a scam, and just hang up the phone, okay? Or delete their message. Don't get involved. All right. So um, have I covered? Oh, before we get into uh, the class, another thing, announcement I wanted to make. So... I've set up a Patreon, okay, the Patreon, and uh, some of you might be familiar with Patreon, Patreon. And so it's a platform where um, <clears throat> uh, if you have a Patreon, you can run subscriptions, you can be posting and reaching out to folks, doing videos. So a whole bunch of things that I do on YouTube, I can do on the Patreon, okay? I signed up with it a while ago, but kind of parked it to the side saying, okay, I'm just going to leave that there until it is needed. So what I did, and for those of you who go to my community page on YouTube, you will see that there was a post I made there some days ago. I said, hey, here's a Patreon. If for any reason you cannot uh, sign up or you're having difficulty signing up for membership on YouTube, you can go to my Patreon and you can sign up. So I've set up everything um, that I set up on YouTube on Patreon. Okay, so you can go there to Patreon and sign up there. Okay, and still get the benefits um, that you would have gotten if you signed up for YouTube. Because I, uh, there are some people, for whatever reason, uh, membership is, doesn't work in their country, doesn't work in their region, or they're you know just having issues with issues so go try out the patreon and see if you can access that okay and then let me know if it is working for you so all the membership levels on patreon with all the discounts and benefits everything is listed there what you get for each membership level and so on and so forth okay mm, have i have i done that yeah okay so we got all of that all right, so let's get into today's class. Um, before, uh, you know, uh, last Saturday we talked about uh, three lessons or so we can we could learn from the expedition. Remember there was a submarine ocean gate that uh, they were doing these tours, to, you know, going to, the, to see the Titanic, okay? Uh, off the coast of Canada in the Atlantic, okay? And unfortunately, last week, um, the last expedition did not go well. And so in, in Saturday's class, we unpacked that, okay? If you have not yet watched that class, I encourage you to go watch that class. We unpacked some spiritual things behind the scenes that was going on with that expedition. We need to understand that we do live in a mysterious world. Yes, we have technological advances. Yes, we, we there are some things that science says to us, oh, it's not magic, it's not magic. We have an explanation. But there are more things than not that we don't have scientific explanations for, okay? There are more things in this world, going on in this world, that we do not have explanations for. So it is only wise that as we go through life, that we are aware that we live in a world of duality. We live in a world of, um, in the physical world and also in the spiritual world, and things happen. And what we do is that we look at what is happening in the physical, to see, are there messages, are there information um, in the physical that is giving us clues about what is happening in the spiritual? 
Okay, let me repeat that. You need to be paying attention to make sure we understand if there are messages in the physical that are giving us clues as to what is happening in the spiritual. We need to be paying attention. We need to pay attention. We can't pretend that we live in a 100% physical world. We don't, you know, we can't pretend, right? While um, I was getting ready for today's class, um, I came across an interesting piece of information again about the Ocean Gate that we talked about last Saturday. And it turns out that the wife, the wife of the CEO of Ocean Gate, Ocean Gate was the company that owned that submarine that went down and didn't come back up again. Okay. So the wife of the CEO is the great, great granddaughter of a couple that chose to perish on the Titanic. Think about that. The wife of the CEO was a great, great granddaughter of a couple, an elderly couple. They were in first class and, you know, they were white and first class. And what had happened was when the lifeboats were being put out, the man was invited to go and escape from the sinking ship on the lifeboat, okay? The man, um, let me see here, let me pull the name. The man is Isidore Strauss and his wife was Rosalie Ida Strauss, okay? So Isidore was invited to go on the boat and he saw that there were young men who had their lives ahead of them who would perish on that ship. Because remember when they were saving lives initially, when they were uh, putting out the lifeboats for, to save people uh, from the Titanic, they were taking only the people in first class and the wealthy people. People who were in third class uh, uh, rooms, the servants, and they, they were not letting those people escape from the ship. So they were letting the rich people escape from the ship first. And, but this man, he looked and he saw that there were young people. And he said, no, I will stay on the ship. Let the young people go. And his wife said, I will stay by my husband's side. Wherever you go, I go. So if my husband is not leaving, I'm going to be here with him. And both of them held hands on the deck of the ship as people were getting into the lifeboat and then the wind swept them away and they perished. This couple were the ones depicted in the Titanic movie. If, if, if you watch the Titanic movie, they were the ones depicted by that couple. If you remember, there was a couple, a, a, a woman was in a bed and she couldn't get up. I think she was sick. And the husband was, you know what? If I can't get my wife out of here, both of us are going to perish here. So he went and lay down beside his wife as the ship was filling with water. That couple in the Titanic, in, that, in the movie, were meant to represent this Isidore and uh, Rosalie Ida Strauss. So in reality, they were on the deck of the ship holding hands as, as they got blown away. But in the movie, they were depicted as being in bed together and just being there until the water just uh, overtook them. So imagine now that the husband of their great-great-granddaughter is the one that perished in that submarine. Do you see how deep this rabbit hole is? Do you see for yourself how deep this rabbit hole is? 
And we will unpack that later. But let's come to this issue of the deadly cobra. So apparently um, there was this uh, pilot in South Africa who, um, you know, let me see here. So apparently this it happened earlier this year where uh, this, this pilot, um, he was flying a private uh, plane and he was already in the air. And then he felt something cold. <laughs> ah, there are things happening in this world. You know, there are things really happening in this world. So this guy, so he's a pilot and he's flying this private plane and he felt something cold rubbing against his side. <laughs> like the thing was cold and moving, you know, just moved against his side. So he's like, what is this cold thing moving against my side? And he looked down and it, and it was a cobra. So this cobra, so as he looked at the cobra, the cobra looked at him and then the cobra started retreating and it went back under his seat. <laughs> <laughs> so he said he froze. I mean, I don't know if any of you have watched the movie Snakes on the Plane with Samuel L. Jackson, okay? And you know that that was a wild movie, okay? Samuel Jackson got on the plane and discovered it was full of snakes. But this guy said, um, the guy, the pilot, uh, Erasmus, he felt the slithering stowaway as he was piloting a private plane from South Africa's Western Cape to the northern town of Nelspruit. Okay. As I turned to my left and looked down, I could see the head of the snake receding back under my seat. <laughs> he said at that moment, he was just shocked and stunned. So what he did was he decided to turn the aircraft around and make an emergency emergency landing at the airport of Welcome. Then he then informed his passengers of what was going on, but everybody on the aircraft, you know, they remained calm, okay? Now you need to understand something about cobras, okay? Cobras, okay, are poisonous. I'm not a snake expert, but I know that cobras are poisonous. Maybe not all of them, but the cobras I know about are, 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 are dangerous, okay? And they can kill somebody pretty quickly. All they do is they bite, inject venom, and it's game over, okay? So, but what is interesting about this, uh, about the situation is that after the plane landed, Okay, after or after he landed the plane and people got out of the plane, they could not find the snake. And they combed that aircraft, searched, they could not find that snake. Now, did everything could not find that snake. Now, there are a number of number of things one could say. One could say, well, Maybe because it's a snake, you know, a snake is very flexible. It, it maybe went into the part of the aircraft where people couldn't reach it. That's a possibility. Uh, someone might say, well, maybe the man imagined it. That's a possibility. Someone might say that maybe he was hallucinating. You no, know, who knows? That's a possibility. But we're not so concerned about where the snake went to. Okay, we're not so concerned about where the snake went to. What we're interested in is the fact that he had a close encounter with a snake. And the snake chose not to bite him. And it's, and, and it's not as if the snake came out and was slithering all around the cockpit. No, the snake came out and deliberately made itself known by rubbing itself against his side. 
And when he looked and saw the snake, it was like the snake was like saying, see you later, and went back under the seat. I do have um, a free YouTube video that I did uh, some years ago about animals, you know, what does it mean when you see animals in your dream, different kinds of animals, okay? And then I have another video about totems, okay? The meaning of, of spiritual totems. And I will encourage you to go to my YouTube channel and go look up those two videos, okay? One about what does it mean to see certain animals in your dreams. And then the other one about totems and what these totems represent. The fact that this cobra came out, rubbed itself against his midsection, drew his attention gently because the snake could have bitten him. Snake did not bite him. Snake did not attack him. It just came out, rubbed itself against him, drew his attention, made sure that he saw it, and then it went back. Okay. That snake wanted the pilot to see it. That snake wanted the pilot to see it. When I was um, a student many, many years ago in, in my early 20s, I had, and, and make a long story short, I woke up one morning, Saturday morning, and decided to clean the room where I was sleeping okay, off campus. And when I raised the mattress, there was a snake there. I had been sleeping on top of the snake. God knows for how long I'd been sleeping, sleeping on top of the snake. And I screamed and hollered and carried on, and I killed that snake. It was a little black snake. I don't know if it was a poisonous snake or not. All I know is that I raised the mattress of the bed trying to clean out, you know, under, and there was the snake, you know, right there. <clears throat> That snake could have bitten me and we wouldn't even be here having this conversation, okay? We, um, okay, uh, Zuleika, okay, you you know the person, Mr. Erasmus, okay, yeah. So Mr. Erasmus in South Africa, there you go. So, when we see incidents like this where a potentially dangerous creature could have harmed us but did not harm us and the creature had the upper hand what do i mean by the creature had the upper hand this guy is flying an aircraft there was no way he could escape from there. It's not like he could just open the window and jump out. Okay. So he was actually at the mercy of the snake. Or like I said, when I was a student, I was in this room with the snake, sleeping on top of a snake. I was at the mercy of the snake. We need to stop and think and say, what does this really mean? Because it's not a coincidence. One of the things we can learn about this is how we are protected even when we don't know that we are in danger. And then we have to ask ourselves, who is protecting me even when I don't know that I am in danger? Who, what, what is protecting me even when I don't know that I am in danger? That was one. Secondly, when you have a potentially dangerous creature choosing not to attack you, but it's letting you know it's there, 
chances are that dangerous creature is on your side and not against you. That dangerous creature is there to protect you and not to attack you. And then you need to start asking questions. Why? Why would a lion that would normally eat people choose to protect me and walk with me, not bite me, not scratch me, not attack me, but is there with me? These are things, but I know sometimes in the heat of the moment, it might be difficult to, because first of all, of course, you're seeing a, a wild creature, a dangerous creature. Your first thought is not like, oh, okay, what a nice uh, animal. What a, no, you're, you're, you know, your first reaction is fear. But after you get out of that situation, you calm yourself down and, and ask yourself, why did this creature not attack me? Why did this creature let me see it? Because the creature could have been there and you wouldn't know. And, it, you know, it wouldn't, you, you would have no way of knowing that this creature is there. But the creature allowed me to see it. It's a dangerous creature and it did not attack me. Why? There are some times when your family totem needs your attention. They will make themselves known. Sometimes when you have a situation like that, they're letting you know that there was something coming at you that was not in the interest of the preservation of your life. But they're like, I got you. And sometimes they're there fighting a battle for you that you yourself are not even aware is going on. There are some people who have very powerful totems that will fight for them, defend them, and when they come and make themselves known, that is the opportunity for you to say thank you and show appreciation to them, spiritually speaking. And when you're showing the appreciation, you don't have to make it a big deal. You go to your sacred space and show that appreciation, or you go into nature and show your appreciation. Because if that animal wanted to deal with you, it would deal with you. And you, you, the, you, you can't escape it, just like the pilot. Tell me where he could have escaped to. Was he going to run out of the cockpit and then start running to the passengers and leave the cockpit? <laughs> Maybe put the aircraft in autopilot to run back to the cockpit and say, ah, there's a snake aboard. No. When we are in situations like that, we need to be grateful and show our gratitude. We need to be reaching out to our spiritual crew, reaching out to our totems, if we know our totems, and start showing appreciation and gratitude. Because more often than not, there was that battle that was going on that you, did, you had no idea how serious that battle was. And that creature came to you, came around you to do battle. In the context of snakes, when we see snakes, deadly snakes that make appearances in this kind of manner,
oftentimes it's a battle over our lives. It's a battle over our lives. Okay. Signifies battles over our lives. Oftentimes our physical life. When snakes show up in this manner, especially these deadly ones, we should realize that it is a very, very serious battle over our lives that's going on that made them to show up in this manner. Same thing when we start seeing lions and tigers. Okay. There are cases in California. Those of you who live in California, you're probably familiar with this also in India, where you're going about your business and a mountain lion or a forest lion will just follow you. And they're not making any attempt to attack you. They're just following you. And you could be going and it's going walking by your side or slightly ahead of you. And you're walking or running and it's it's not making any attempt whatsoever to intersect with you. You're going and it's going alongside you or going slightly ahead of you. That is some serious protection going on. And they have made themselves visible, not just for your benefit, but for the benefit of another person or another thing that can also see them. Because there's sometimes... <laughs> I don't even know how to put this nicely for the kind of platform we're on. You know, we have to be very careful about the platform we're on, okay? Um, we, there are some times that we see that we don't see what is seeing us. But our totems and our spiritual crew are seeing things that we do not see. And so when that thing is a threat to us in the spiritual, they show themselves in the spiritual. But when those things are a threat to us in the physical, They will show themselves in the physical. And usually we're only seeing part of what's going on. We're not seeing the complete thing that is going on. All we know is that we saw this creature. It's a deadly creature. It's a dangerous creature. But... We don't have the full picture of why that creature decided to show itself, make itself seen, and make itself known. When they make themselves seen and known to us, it's for our own reassurance. But oftentimes we misinterpret it and we're afraid. Oh my God, there's a snake. Ah! And we're afraid. And so we misinterpret that. But for those who have spiritual vision, when they see that creature, it is clear to them why that creature is there. And they leave it alone for it to do what it's supposed to be doing. 
So when we are in situations like this, like let's say this Erasmus, a pilot who was involved in this situation, ideally, if you have your wits about you, because again, under normal circumstances, we will be terrified. Left to myself, I'll probably be screaming in that cockpit, okay? Come. Because I don't want to be cooped up with a cobra inside a, a cockpit high in the sky. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, it's not exactly um, my idea of a good time. Okay. But after, you know, you, you land the aircraft or you get yourself out of that situation and you gather yourself, just say thank you. Just say thank you. Say thank you to that totem animal. Say thank you. And ask your spiritual crew for an understanding or revelation on about why that creature showed up or what it was supposed to do. Now, remember again, this is after you've gathered, you know, you've gotten yourself together because... I understand it can be a terrifying experience. You just say thank you. I thank my creator. I thank my guardian spirit. I thank my ancestors. I thank my spirit guides. And I thank that totem spirit, you, that came to me and made me see you. Thank you for playing your part, doing what you needed to do. Now, let's unpack this a little bit more. There are some schools of thought that will say, when these animals come and they don't attack you, it is your own crew that is preventing them from attacking you. Because I could see someone asking a question, well, okay, granted that the cobra came and, and touched the guy and went back down, maybe it's his spiritual crew that was scaring the cobra away. And here's my response to that. If that cobra was against him, the cobra would have been in an attack stance. It would have positioned itself. It's just like if you if you're you know uh, um, jogging in North Carolina where there are mountain lions, and then the mountain lion is seeing you go. Ah, ah, ah but it doesn't attack you, but it's obviously, ah, 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 but it, it somehow something is preventing it from attacking you, then you can rest assured that something is preventing it from attacking you. And you can rest assured that that creature is not for you. It's against you, but you have such protection because for the animal to come up, even if it's a snake and it's doing all this, but it's not coming for you, but it keeps, you know, doing its thing and doing its thing, but it's never attacking you. You have to rest assured that that creature is seeing things that you are not seeing. It is seeing your, what is defending you. It's seeing your defense. It sees what is defending you. And it cannot go beyond that thing that is defending you. And so that's why it's out there doing all its drama and its acrobatics and whatnot. But it cannot attack you. So so we have, I don't know if you're understanding me. So, so there's a situation where the animal, if it is looking like aggressive and trying to attack but unable to attack, then you know that, yeah, this creature is not here on my behalf. This creature is coming here to do some damage. And I'm being protected from it. But if the creature is not aggressive towards you, it's not trying to attack you, it just comes and lets you know, like, hey, I'm here. You can rest assured that you have some affinity, some connection with that that creature could be a representation more often than not is a representation of the totem in your lineage i remember and i think i told this story uh, um, uh, last year or the year before 
about dreaming about an animal and I was carrying the animal in my dream. And someone came in the dream and said, why are you carrying this animal around? You're carrying this animal like a child, you know? And I was like, yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to carry this animal like a child. And when I woke up, I was thinking about this dream and I was like, what does this mean? Why was I dreaming about this animal and I'm carrying this animal around like a child? So I thought about it that morning and uh, I was like, okay, I guess time will reveal what this means. So I went to work that day and on the job, folks on the job, in the workplace, on the job, Somebody brought that animal to me on the job as a pet. In my dream, I had a baby version of this animal. I went to work and somebody brought this animal, a baby version of this animal to me on the job and said, oh, I was wondering if I could have this animal around you. And the animal... Then the person showed me the animal, and the animal jumped up my body. That same day, I had the dream that night, went to work, and the person brought the animal to me. That was that totem letting me know that, hey, I am here, and I need your attention. I need you to bring me closer to you. So it wasn't just sufficient for that animal totem to reveal itself to me in the dream. It had to come in the physical to reinforce that message. It had to come in the physical. So we find out that when these creatures show up in the physical, they are oftentimes reinforcing a message that is already being delivered. And sometimes we're ignoring the message or we don't understand what that message means. And so it shows up in the physical. We've been ignoring it, but it shows up in the physical because we are required to take a certain action. And oftentimes, we may not know immediately what action we're supposed to take. We may not know what action we're supposed to take. And so that's why I say to you, the first thing you say is thank you. Thank you for showing yourself to me. Thank you for revealing yourself to me. Thank you for bringing yourself to my attention. Thank you. And that's what I did when that person brought that animal to me. I said, thank you. I said, thank you to the person that brought the animal. And I said, thank you to the animal. And that the animal grabbed me and didn't want to let me go. And I wasn't afraid. Because I understood what the message was. And I, I handed the animal back to the person and away they went, I never saw them again. We look in the physical and pay attention to the physical to understand the spiritual message that is being delivered that requires our attention. When these creatures show up, there is something that requires our attention. There is something that requires our attention. And like I said earlier, I encourage you to go watch uh, those two videos. One is the meaning of animals in your dreams and the second one about totems, animal totems. I have a video on animal totems. You can go watch the video on animal totems and understand Okay, when these animals show up, what do they mean? 
Let me add this. In several indigenous cultures, and I know this may sound fantastic to those of you who consider yourself westernized, civilized, sophisticated, and so on and so forth. But over here, where we learn about practical spirituality, we don't care about that. We don't care about that. In a number of indigenous religions across the world, and I say across the world because it is not peculiar to just one location or peculiar to one, um, it's not peculiar to a certain tribe or ethnic group. Okay. There is this um, concept of people being able to um, change into animals, okay? Uh, let me look up that word. The word just escapes me right now. Therian, therian, thropy. Therianthropy, therianthropy, that's what that word is. Therianthropy is the mythological or magical ability of individuals to metamorphose into animals or hybrids by means of shape shifting. Okay. That is the and there's another there's another term I was thinking of is a trans uh trans something I was thinking of, but that word escapes me right now. Okay. In indigenous cultures, people have written about it. Uh, they've told stories about it. There are people in certain families that have or used to have the ability to transform themselves into certain animals, okay? And there were reasons for doing that. Sometimes the reasons were good and sometimes the reasons were not so good. Okay. But people would have the ability, and, and I understand someone who comes from a Western perspective will say, oh yeah, that's fairy tales, that story, have you ever seen that? And so on and so forth. Personally, have I seen somebody shape shift into an animal? No. Remember, we're bringing our authentic selves here. Have I personally seen somebody change their shape into an animal? No. But I will tell you this, that the elders in my family often told these stories. And when they would tell these stories back in the day, these people I'm talking about, they're now, they've been long ancestors now, old ancestors now, okay? But when they told the story about how these people changed themselves, transmogrified themselves, okay, changed themselves into animals, there was always a good reason for doing so. It wasn't like, let me change myself into some animal shape and wow people and collect money from them. It wasn't like I'm doing it like a circus, you know, for entertainment or to make people afraid of me. No, there was always a reason, a very good reason why they did that. Sometimes they would do it for protection. Sometimes they would do it when they were going to war. They would do that. And I remember as a child, they would tell us the stories of who did it and how they did it. Not the exact mechanisms about how they did it, but they will say, okay, so the person went into the forest and then they came out and they, they became this. Or they went into the room, the back room in the house, okay? 
and came out and they became that. And you find out that there was a reason. It was never for show. It was never for entertainment. There was always a good reason for that. Sometimes they would change themselves into a little creature. Let's say that they were being overwhelmed in war or there's a, a fight going on, someone trying to kill them. They could change into an animal that could easily run and hide. Sometimes the person attacking him or the people attacking them would, would change themselves. And so you'd have an animal against animal situation. Okay. So I say this to say that these concepts are not unknown to indigenous people. And there are stories upon stories of people, even in Europe, amongst the, the ancient people of Europe. I'm not talking about the, the modern Europeans now, but in ancient lineages and ancient clans in Europe. For those of you who might be thinking, okay, maybe it only happened in Asia and Africa and South America. No, it also, you have stories of that in Europe. And that's where the story of Dracula comes from the story of werewolves, vampires, okay, chimeras, uh, uh, Medusa. That's where those stories originate from. The concept of someone changing into an animal or some form of hybrid of an animal, but there was always a reason for that. Is it a useful thing to have in our world of high technology now that's up for debate? Do I need to change myself into something to protect myself from somebody? Maybe I do, maybe I don't. Depends on what's going on. And in some places around the world today, there are people who claim that they can still do these things. They can still shapeshift. They can still change themselves into other creatures. But again, the point of today's class is not about teaching how we can change ourselves or whether people can change themselves or not. The fact is that there's a reason for any for things and we need to be paying attention we need to be paying attention why are these things showing up i believe um i someone once told me to, a, a year or two ago about how after they bought a new house with a swimming pool in the back, they would have snakes there. And the snakes would be there just watching the children. And this person would be scared why are all these snakes here? And it wasn't like the snakes were attacking the, their kids or anything like that. The snakes would just, anytime the children would be there, the snakes would just come and just be, you know, just there, position themselves. There are communities in Africa where they have pythons that, that guard come into the homes and take care of the children or not take care of them in terms of changing their diapers and feeding them. But, you know, like maybe mom is away or in the backyard or something. Snake would just come there. The python would just come there and lay that down there. And you can't just run up into that home and touch any of the children there. And the people in those communities accepted 
the function of those spirit guides, of those animal totems. They accepted the function of those animal totems. So they don't go about killing the animal. Whenever they see the animal there, they will say, thank you. Thank you for coming back. Thank you for keeping an eye on the kids while I was out there doing something. And, the, and, and after they would give thanks to the creature, the creature would just quietly go away and go back into the bushes. Okay. But there was always a reason why these animals would show up. Okay. So we learn from this. If you've learned anything from today's class, let's have your eye in the comment section. Let's have your eye. I'm aware that, <clears throat> like I said earlier, I'm aware that for some folks it's kind of late. If you've learned something from today's class. Let's have your I, your A-Y-E in the comment section. Okay. Okay. All right, I see you, Quandera in Canada. You've learned something. Let's have your I A Y E in the comment section. Okay. So that Mr. Rasmus. Hopefully, um, somebody advised that Mr. Erasmus, the pilot, to give thanks. We live in a mysterious world. We live in a mysterious world. And we need to be treating the world we live in with a lot of respect. Okay. We need to be treating it with a lot of respect. And when we don't understand what is going on, we can ask our spiritual crew and say, can you give me an explanation, some kind of explanation as to what is going on? And they will explain. They will explain. They will come to you in your dreams and explain. Okay? They will come to you in your dreams and they will explain. Or they will send somebody to you to explain. You might go out somewhere and be having an unexpected conversation. And your experience, you know, becomes part of that conversation. And then you're like, oh, okay, is this what this means? You might have someone coming up to you and telling you a story very similar to your experience. And then you use that person's story to understand your own experience of what happened. Okay, so again... Thank you for coming to class. I know it's kind of late wherever you are. So thank you to those who are in class right now and to those who will come to class later. Okay. This world is deep. This world is mysterious. Okay. So remember again, if you need me for your divinations or consultations, want to talk to me about your situation, please go to my website at tochi.us, T-O-C-H-I.us, okay? Go there, um, book an appointment. I have appointments available. Book an appointment with me. It will be dedicated time with me to talk about your issue or the thing that concerns you. And we'll talk about that and find out what the solutions are. I will say this. When you book a consultation with me, when you book your divination with me, I ask you to be open-minded. I, I just have to mention this. Actually, if you're booking a divination or consultation with anyone, not just me, you, you and I need to learn how to be open-minded. There's sometimes when we're so engrossed in our own self-diagnosis 
that we are not listening to what the person is telling us is the solution to a problem because we are so fixated on what we think is a correct solution to the problem. And the person is trying to deliver the message and we're not listening because we think you know what? I know my problem. I know what's going on. And I, uh, you know, I can't let know what you're saying. No, 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 no. When you go for divination, when you go for a consultation, try your best to remain open minded. And I've said this before that even if you go to a fake diviner, even if you go to a fake spiritual practitioner, there are sometimes, if your spiritual crew is trying to do everything to communicate with you, they will use that fake diviner, they will use that fake spiritual pr practitioner to deliver the message. So the person might be talking nonsense, but you will find sense in the nonsense. You will locate the sense in the nonsense. If your crew is desperate for certain information to be made known to you, they will make you find sense in the middle of the nonsense. And I'm not just talking about you going for a divination to find out, oh, uh, I want this guy to be my man and why is he rejecting me and chasing me away or, you know, something like that? No, there are some times you are in a... Okay, let me give an example. There are some times that you may need just clarity. And, and you have done your invocations, you've done prayers, you've done all kinds of things, and you're like, I need clarity about this particular situation. And you go talk to a complete stranger. And that stranger will explain to you, and maybe they're telling a story. And in their own minds, they feel, oh, I'm just telling a story. But your spiritual crew is using that person to deliver a message to you. And the person, that stranger, doesn't even realize that they're delivering a message to you. It happens. It happens. There are times that, that these things happen. Because... You are in a situation where it is challenging to get a message through to you through normal means. So they, your crew will use whatever means, even if it means to use a child, a child can come up to you and start telling you things. A child will come up and start telling you things. So that you can start getting direction some kind of direction about your circumstance. It happens. There's sometimes our spiritual crew is so desperate. Our spiritual crew is so desperate to communicate with us. They will use whomever, whatever is available. So that's why I say when you go for a divination, even if you're not in total agreement, just calm down and listen to what is being said in the first place. Calm down and listen first. Before you, before you rush to judgment, before you start arguing, calm down and listen first. Not everything requires a ritual to solve it. Not everything requires a spell to solve it. Not everything. Sometimes what is going on with you is a confirmation of something else. And I know that when we talk about spirituality, the first thing is people are concerned about, do you have a ritual? Do you have a spell? Do you have a this? Do you have a that I can do? Do you have some bay leaves I can throw around? Do you have some sage? I want to burn some sage. 
Sometimes that is not the solution. And you want to make sure that you are applying the right solution to the right problem. You don't want to be wasting your time and applying a wrong solution to the wrong problem. And then you start getting frustrated. Oh my God, God is not listening to me. My spiritual crew not listening to me. No, you are the one who's not listening. You are the one who is moving ahead with your self-diagnosis, thinking you know everything, and you are applying the wrong solution to the problem. So whether you, you, you book a consultation with me or book it with someone else, I have to remind you, be patient. Spiritual work takes time. Spiritual work takes time. Be patient. Don't be in a hurry to compete with other people. Be in a hurry to align yourself with your spiritual crew and fulfill your life destiny. Your time is not the same as someone else's time. Your time is not the same as someone else's time. Be in constant communication with your spiritual crew. When you wake up in the morning, say good morning to your spiritual crew. When you go to bed at night, say good night to your spiritual crew. Even something as simple like that opens the channels of communication. Good morning to your spiritual crew and good night to your spiritual crew, okay? We're thankful to our creator, our guardian spirits, our ancestors, our spirit guides, and all those in the unseen realms who teach us things that are considered to be forbidden fruit so that we can fulfill our life destiny. Ashe, Ise, Kamagu, Tokoza, Vesedi, Mokwando, Ayubopo, Inyenho, Mia, in the court, so more to be. It is done, it is finished, it is complete. Thank you for coming to class. Remember, uh, members, uh, we have class on Friday, and then on Saturday, we'll have another uh, touching base class, and we're going to deal with a very interesting uh, story on Saturday. So make sure you show up on time on Saturday for Saturday's class of members. Make sure you're watching all your member videos. Remember they're there as uh, perks of your membership, okay? Love you all.
How to be more direct in your conversations. How to be more direct in your conversations. Okay, so we got the Instagram then. Okay, Zalika. In South Africa, there is a clan which resembles a snake called Omajola. After they give birth to the babies related to that creature, the snake surrounds the newborn with no harm. Yeah. The the um the the Ebos of Nigeria. Uh the Bibios and also um trying to think of this this uh, ethnic group in Cameroon. Um, they also have something similar in West Africa. Um, the Those pythons are venerated, highly, highly venerated and respected in their cultures and are considered to be protectors. Yeah. So... So thank you for sharing that, Zoraika. What's going on with these phones? Are you charging? All right, so take care, everybody.